Um, next up on the stage is going to be Jamil Zaki. He is uh, one of uh, a, a group of young scientists who are uh, moving forward on the frontiers of social neuroscience. He used to be a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University, as it says in your schedule. But we've lured him to Stanford, so he's the youngest assistant professor there in the psych department. His research focuses on uh, the psychology and neuroscience of empathy, as well as the cognitive and neural bases of social behavior, and in particular on how people understand each other's emotions, empathic accuracy, why they conform to each other, which would be social influence, and why they choose to help each other, altruism. And uh, we're very excited to have him at Stanford. We're very excited to have him at this conference. So please welcome to this podium, Jamil Zaki. Okay, uh, thanks for having me here. Thanks for getting up on a Sunday with us. Uh, thanks to Jim and uh, the other organizers for having me at this conference. I wanted to just start out by saying uh, this is definitely one of the best conferences I've ever been to in my life. Uh, to, right? Let's have a hand for, for everyone who's put it together. Uh, to have so many uh, such strong researchers uh, together in a relatively small group focusing on a single theme and attempting to unpack understand and expand on compassion, I think is, uh, is one, this is the type of conference where uh, things can actually get done. Uh, and I, I hope that this is not the last time uh, that, that we'll be together uh, discussing these, these issues. Uh, okay, so I'll be focusing today on pro-social behavior and why, uh, why we might be so inclined to act pro-socially towards other people. I want to begin by thanking my close collaborator on all of this work, Jason Mitchell at Harvard University. He's not always that sleepy. Uh, and also uh, the Templeton Positive Neuroscience Initiative for funding our work. So uh, I like to just start out with the obvious. Uh, people are the world champions of niceness. Uh, we do nice things for all sorts of people all the time, uh, even if those people are not part of our group and can't do nice things for us in return. Uh, so, for example, after the tragic earthquake in Haiti a few years ago, you might have seen, if you use Facebook, posts like this one um, that, that told you that you could uh, donate $10 to the Red Cross by texting Haiti to some number. So this propagated through people's social networks and created uh, a, a veritable wildfire of pro-sociality, one of the largest private donation campaigns in history. Uh, much less common were posts like this actual Facebook post I saw a few days later. To donate money to me, please text an address uh, to, to this number. I will meet you and pick up either cash or check. Uh, and, and the funny thing is that uh, this guy at the bottom here is actually doing uh, the normative thing uh, uh, by, uh, by the account of many evolutionary and economic models that suggest that, in fact, we shouldn't care what happens to strangers thousands of miles away. We should look out for ourselves. Uh, but we don't see his behavior as normative. We don't even see it as simply counter-normative. Instead, it seems like he's really missing out on something critical uh, about what it is to be human. And having gone to high school with him, I can confirm that this guy is missing something. Um, so, so a lot of my work focuses on what is it about human beings that makes us so inclined? What is it that makes us want to help other people? Uh, and, and, and there are lots of answers to this question. Um, I'll, I'll try to highlight a couple of these. One is a kind of regulatory uh, answer, which is that humans, among other things, are really good at uh, not doing what we want, but doing what we know is best, right? So, um, so we choose to make healthy choices, have a salad for lunch, uh, go to bed early, all these things, not because we want to do them, but because uh, we, we know that that's best. And in the case of prosociality, maybe we do things for other people because we know that's what's best, but maybe that's not our actual desire. So uh, to use a metaphor, Acting selfishly might be like uh, eating some chocolate, uh, whereas acting pro-socially might be uh, a, a social form of, of Brussels sprouts. Although I, have, I should pause and say, I love Brussels sprouts, and if prepared correctly, they're delicious. Um, but I think, so I think that there's, there's certainly some explanatory power to this model, and I think that there's lots of great evidence that indeed uh, people uh, employ regulatory capacities when deciding to be pro-social. But I think that that's not the whole story. Uh, and, and there's lots of, uh, of evidence coming out now suggesting that even without regulating your, your, yourself, uh, people might uh, want to be pro-social. So some of this uh, evidence is developmental. So children, even before they have the capacity to regulate very much, uh, appear inclined to act pro-socially. And uh, I, I, this is represented in, in one of my favorite studies ever really from Felix Varnikin. Uh, this is a modern classic where he demonstrated that uh, 18 month olds in this, this picture here, 
uh, or this video, um, when they see someone uh, who's unable to accomplish a goal on their own, without any prompting, choose to help, right? <laughs> so in addition to being so damn cute, uh, this, this is really powerful evidence that maybe there might be another mechanism at work in promoting prosociality. So what might it be? Uh, well, I'm going to suggest that maybe uh, prosociality itself might be a different form of social chocolate, right? It might be something that we really uh, enjoy doing. Uh, and I'll, I'll present you with two pieces of evidence uh, to support this. One, that prosociality exhibits neural signatures associated with the experience of reward, and also that it uh, produces patterns of behavior that we know are associated with uh, what people do when they're seeking out rewards for themselves. Um, okay, so we'll start with the neural signatures of reward. Uh, I'll just focus on one area today. Uh, Brian and, and others here uh, will we'll talk about the nucleus accumbens. Well, Brian already talked about it. I, I, think, uh, I think we'll hear more about it, though. Um, but I'll, I'll focus here on the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Um, and this is an area that's been found over and over again uh, in human studies uh, and, and analogous regions in animal studies as well to be engaged uh, by events in the environment that organisms find rewarding, right? So food, water, money, beautiful faces, pieces of art that you like, uh, anything that, that people find subjectively valuable uh, tends to engage this region with a high degree of consistency. So we wanted to know whether this same region might be engaged when people choose to do something pro-social for someone else. And we focused on a type of pro-sociality that economists have studied uh, for a long time through games in which uh, they choose how to divide a pie. Not, not an actual pie, but a, but a kind of pot of money. Uh, and lots of research from economics suggests that people prefer when, uh, when pies of money are divided equally, uh, when, when uh, they're divided in a way such that uh, members of a group or a pair of people uh, maximally benefit together as opposed to kind of unfairly uh, splitting it such that one person gets everything and another person gets much less. Uh, and a great recent study, uh, bless you, from uh, Elizabeth Trichomi, demonstrated that uh, observing other people uh, divide uh, resources in this way, which I would call equitable or efficient for a group, uh, watching other people act in this way engages this uh, region of ventromedial PFC uh, that, that I've been telling you about. So in this first study, we wanted to see what would happen when people uh, make decisions themselves to act pro-socially. So we used what's known as a dictator game uh, in which a person decides uh, whether to give money to themselves or another person. It's actually a modification on a dictator game. So let's say that Jason is our subject, uh, and he's got this uh, friend of his, TJ. Uh, it's not really a friend, uh, it's a stranger. Um, so Jason might decide whether he wants to give a uh, dollar to himself or a dollar and 33 cents to another person. Um, uh, participants in, in this study who were uh, being scanned by, with fMRI made about 200 of these choices. And critically, uh, sometimes the amount that they stood to gain was smaller than the amount that they could give to another person, and other times the reverse was true. So this set up kind of two factors uh, in, in the types of decisions that people could make. Right? One is they could be selfish and take something for themselves, or they could be generous by giving something to another person. But another dimension is that they could do what's in the best interest of the pair by giving to the person who stands to gain the most, or they could do what's in the worst interest of the pair, which is to give to the person who stands to gain the least. least. And that's what I would call equitable versus inequitable decision making. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. Um, so, for example, Jason here could choose to be a jerk and take a smaller amount for himself instead of giving a larger amount to this other person. That would be self-serving and inequitable. Um, he could do the nice thing and be generous and equitable by giving to the person who stands to gain the most. Um, but he could also be self-serving in a way that's good for the group, right, by giving to the person who stands to gain the most himself in this case. Right, so, so uh, with, and, and we found that people made all these different types of choices. So um, with these data in hand, uh, we could look for the neural signatures of equitable versus inequitable decision making. And I want to remind you that this could have gone a number of ways. If we believe that uh, equitable or pro-social decision making is mental Brussels sprouts, if it's, if it's really requiring you to exert control, then we might Im imagine that these types of decisions would engage brain regions that we know are involved in such control uh, 
uh, specifically the lateral prefrontal cortex. If we instead believe that uh, prosociality is, is like mental chocolate, then we might expect that it would engage regions that are associated with the experience of reward, um, for example, the VMPFC or nucleus accumbens. And by the title of the talk, I'm sure you know how this is going to turn out. Um, we found data strongly consistent with the second of these interpretations. Um, equitable decision making engaged this region of VMPFC that's associated with reward. I can show you uh, engagement of this region in each for each type of decision. And what we find is that, in fact, uh, this region seems to uh, be engaged equally by self-serving or generous decisions so long as they're equitable, so long as they're maximizing for the pair of people, right? Um, but interestingly, this region responds with a strong negative deflection when people act inequitably, which was remarkable to me because this is a condition, this blue bar here represents a condition in which people are winning money. They're gaining money for, for themselves, and many, many studies have demonstrated that the VMPFC is engaged by winning money. So why would it be disengaged here well, we think that this is consistent with the idea that the subjective value of winning money here is almost overridden by the fact that in order to get money, subjects had to do something unfair, right? So, so this is, I think, consistent with the idea that just people find it more subjectively valuable to do what's in the best interest of the group uh, than to do what's in their own interest, at least in this context. Okay, so I'll move on to um, another kind of uh, way that we could test this hypothesis that prosociality is uh, is rewarding, and that's be because we know the ways that people act when they uh, are faced with something rewarding. Right? They crave it. They do all sorts of things uh, to try to achieve these rewarding outcomes. And interestingly, sometimes the things that they do are not in their best interest. Right? So there's one uh, kind of quality that we have when we uh, when we seek reward, which is that we're very impatient. And psychologists and economists have studied this impatience for a long time uh, in what they call temporal discounting, right? So um, this is people's preferences for small rewards now as opposed to uh, large rewards later. So for example, if you knew you were going to give a talk in the morning, you might uh, think that it's the be in your best interest to go to sleep early. But then maybe your friends uh, might ask you out for a drink, and, uh, and you might decide to cash in on that uh, smaller reward, although maybe that's actually a larger reward in the end. We'll see. Uh, more research ahead. Um, so, so I was interested in the idea that perhaps uh, people uh, faced with the opportunity to act pro-socially might also experience that as a reward that they want right now, uh, and that they might try to achieve that reward by being impatiently or impulsively pro-social. Um, and it, it, I think about this vis-a-vis -vis the phenomenology of gift giving, right? So imagine that you're walking in downtown Telluride and you, uh, you see a perfect gift for your mom. You know that this will be the best thing that she, she could have for her birthday. Um, you buy it for her, you're very excited. The issue is that her birthday is in three months, right? So you can do a couple of different things. One, you can patiently wait to give her this present on her birthday, and that would be maximally enjoyable to her. Uh, it would make her day very special and all this. Uh, or you could choose to just call her up right now and tell her, hey, I got you this great present, uh, which would be great for you, uh, and, but, but maybe not as good for her. And if you're anything like me, you, you do ruin the surprise uh, almost every time. Um, <laughs> So, so I was interested in whether we could uh, observe this type of behavior more formally um, through, uh, through a temporal discounting uh, approach. So temporal discounting paradigms, for those of you who are not familiar with them, um, uh, give people these types of choices between, for example, a smaller reward that they could have today or a larger reward that they could have later. So we uh, gave people these types of choices over and over again, varying the, uh, the amount of, of reward that they could have later and the, uh, and, and the delay that they would have, the amount of time they'd have to wait to get that reward. Um, so critically, we did this in three different conditions. In a self-condition, people were just making decisions about, uh, about what reward they would want for themselves. Um, in a gift condition, we told them, hey, look, oh, sorry, uh, we, we said, hey, look, you can give this anonymous present to another person. Uh, do you want it to be a smaller present right now that you would give them, or would you prefer to wait uh, to give them a, a larger present? And I should say that it's not that people would have to wait and then do anything. We were just going to deliver this present to, to another person um, at, at a time that the, that the subject chose. And then we had a third condition, which was a neutral or fiduciary uh, choice, where people, again, were making decisions about a reward that another person would get, but it was not framed as a pro-social gift. 
It was framed as just a neutral decision about what would you like this person to receive. And we found that this had a, a pretty big impact on behavior. So here, um, here I have the proportion of patient choices that people made uh, as a function of how long the delay was that they would have to wait for the larger reward. And you can see that uh, this kind of bowed type of curve uh, is, is an index of how impatient people are, right? So as, as they have to wait longer, they, they basically stop making any patient choices. Um, and, and this is, w the amount of discounting that we saw here uh, is pretty common for the self-condition, but remarkably, what we found is that people were just as impatient when deciding what type, when they would like to give a gift to another person as they were when deciding what type of reward they would want themselves. But when they were making a neutral choice for another person, they were significantly more patient. And we can uh, formally uh, assess this through what's called um, uh, a discounting function, and we find that indeed uh, the gift and self conditions, people are, are equally impatient, uh, but, but they're much more patient for, uh, for the neutral or fiduciary choice. So what does this tell us? I think it tells us that both self-interested uh, and pro-social choices can be like a form of, of psychological chocolate. We can enjoy those choices. We act towards those choices as, as we do towards other rewards. So this is, uh, I guess, good to the extent that it makes people pro-social. But what I want to highlight also is that this might not be the only route towards pro-sociality, and it might not be the one that's healthiest. Right here, we have people making suboptimal decisions because they crave uh, they they crave pro sociality so much. And uh, you know, I, I was thinking about what Jimpa was saying a couple of days ago, where uh, compassion is really should it is and should be an other regarding uh, form of of psychological phenomenon. Here, I think what we have is a very self-regarding form of pro-sociality. So while this is good in as, insofar as it drives pro-social behavior, uh, I think that that we should uh, we should feel cautious about, about wanting to, uh, about when we're being pro-social because we really truly want to help others and when we're being pro-social because we want to help ourselves. Thanks very much.